I'm going to react a bit to um, and let you react a bit to this uh, to these presentations and uh, have a few questions with you, and then we'll uh, pass the the mic to the audience who may want to to react to your presentations. Um, First, uh, my first question is maybe like if you have any uh, like reaction or comment or question following each other's presentation, maybe some uh, some reaction. Well, I, I totally agree with the fact that um, entrepreneurs need to be at the center of the ecosystem. I think that's an important part and that comes through in Brad Feld's book as well. Um, because without them, there isn't an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And actually, following that um, that reaction, I think a question that maybe a lot of local governments probably wonder is like, what should be the role of the city hall, or like, in a broader sense, also the role of government. But since we talk about cities, specifically local governments, like whether it's for events or for identity or for building this this institution we are talking about, what should be the right approach? Because we see a lot of cities that really want to market themselves, sometimes aggressively, uh, as the new startup city. Should they like completely let go, or what can they do to help? What's the right approach? Uh, I was struck by the fact that we, even we, if we use different words, we tend to talk about the same things, so institutions, soft infrastructure, um, and so on. Um, the, Behind all that, there are practices, things that people do every day because that's the way you do it. That's the optimal way or you're just imitating your neighbor uh, or successful entrepreneurs show the way by uh, uh, proving that it works. W what cities should do is enabling those willing to, willing to experiment with practices. Um, so there are many times when practices go against an existing rule, and so the rule becomes an obstacle for uh, growing the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And so at that point, there are usually people lobbying the government very hard, and the government says, answers by saying that, oh no, but I help startup, look at the, the, the large incubator I just built there, and we have to explain to city officials that no, we're not interested in the incubator. As office space is not an issue for startups. But that rule in the tax code goes against a practice that would make a big difference for early stage startups when they raise capital, for instance. And uh, so what cities should do is stop building large incubators and pay attention to what comes out what kind of demands come out of the bottom uh, of the bottom uh, through the bottom up. Sorry, Jennifer, I don't know if you have any opinion on that, like from not the Paris context, but your own context. Yeah, so I was working for a local city um, to start Tech Week, uh, and we had some teams that were wanting to run startup competitions and run events and I just, yeah, I don't think that's the way forward for a city. I think there's probably enough activity already happening and nobody really wants bureaucrats designing events and competitions. Um, it's better to get people out there in the ecosystem and support the work they're doing. So I think the city's role is really to support and advocate um, but something, this feedback out of that strategy piece of work that I did with the event organizers, they really struggled for a space. Um, I had a friend that was running a meetup that asked to run it in our boardroom. I'm like, oh God, you don't want to do that. It's, it's not that exciting. It doesn't fit the culture of your group. Um, and found this again and again that people were asking for a space. And uh, we actually... We went and created some infrastructure in Auckland, an innovation precinct, but with that we also created a space that would be provided um, for free for meetup groups or, or at a really kind of reasonable price for them. I think having that place to belong, for the ecosystem to belong, can be really important when you're trying to create some coordination initially. Uh, I think in Lisbon now the line is really thin and we are having this discussion. Uh, first at the beginning, it's interesting to create uh, that they created that structure and the basis, you know, like you know, trying to represent the ecosystem in any way. 
And that was the goal, you know, to give him a face and to tell people, you can come here and you can get information and we can help and we can provide you with whatever you want. Uh, but now they are going into space, which is uh, leading to a lot of discussions on if they are taking the role of investors or taking the role, um, you know, that probably that role shouldn't be the government's role to give, you know, to build a space, a huge space in Lisbon that will, that will, um, uh, will happen maybe this year, even this year. And they are discussing that. So I don't have an answer for that, but I know that it's generating a lot of discussions between people and private investors who want to build incubators or you who want to build co-working spaces. And they are, you know, that role is being taken by, you know, a few of the structures of the, of the city of Lisbon. And it's generating a lot of discussion. Yeah, you mean like they're like a preempting like the most interesting locations and space where there would have been other private initiatives otherwise? Get it, sir. You mean they preempt like the best locations, like some locations where there could have been yeah. so, maybe better private initiatives. Yeah, babies, basically there is an area in Lisbon still un, a little bit underdeveloped, so industrial area that it's now you know, starting, to, you know, starting to warm, and you feel that there's a lot of startups going there and a lot of companies who are taking old warehouses. You, know, you see this pattern happen in other cities, and it's happening already in Lisbon, also in Lisbon. And, you know, one of the biggest space, spaces that belongs to the army, it's, uh, you know, it's being used and it's going to be used by the city of Lisbon uh, as, a, uh, you know, like a hub, like a huge hub for entrepreneurs. But th that project is being managed by the city itself and not by, you know, private investors. Of course, now they are trying to bring them along, but it's not, it's not, it's not, an, easy, it's not an easy position now for them. Yeah. Uh, um I know we've talked about, you know, where it's government's role. I think uh, what we've seen in, in Auckland as well, because it's such a small place and um, there are only four and a half million people in the whole country. Uh, government has stepped in and got things started. And I don't think there's any harm in that if nobody's naturally stepping forward. Um, that they, you know, through initiatives, um, demand has been created. But I think then it's important that government then steps away and actually starts by you know, JVing with somebody who's interested but can't really see the business model and then, you know, government pulls back and they take over as, as the need is built. And that is an appropriate area, I think, that local or central government can actually play a role in kick-starting various parts. We've definitely seen that in the investment space in New Zealand. Thanks a lot. Um, that, that makes me think, like, the, the question regarding who should be driving the growth of, of this ecosystem and I, you, you all agree on the fact that okay the city can be supportive but entrepreneurs should be at the center of that but so to to start this process basically you need I guess to have some first successful entrepreneurs that can reinvest their money their energy then their networks into um, increasing the strength of the ecosystem and so on so how do you actually like get this machine started like is there any process or step to because it's like you, you really need to have these first successes that can then build further successes and so on is there any advice on that it's a very tough challenge to start the process because when you look at silicon valley silicon valley in recent years has become has um, improved the art of starting a startup with, with the new model of the accelerator that takes care of the many problems uh, that every start early stage entrepreneur has uh, when, it, when it begins operations. And um, the, 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 the difference between the Valley and other ecosystems is that the Valley already um, has already very large companies. And so they know the critical way from uh, the garage to the global domination. And they can reverse engineer what happened in large company to detect what should be done at the very early start. Um, the problem we have in an ecosystem like Paris is that we don't have large companies uh, that, are, that have already succeeded not as large as Google or Facebook or others. And so we don't really know what it takes to go from zero to the higher level. And without knowing that, it's 
almost useless to invest too many resources at the early stage. All those incubators, accelerators are, uh, are not the result of reverse, reverse engineering the success of local companies. They're the result of uh, ideas, unproven ideas rega regarding the ecosystem. And so what you should do, that, that's why it's really, uh, you should really um, leave the entrepreneur in control because they're they're the ones who are the most able to explore the, that critical path to uh, building large companies. And you need a first generation that will suffer and have a very hard time overcoming the obstacles to, to finally understand what it takes to go from zero, zero to the infinite in a particular ecosystem. And so without knowing that, you can only work like, well, like the family. We, it's not proven, but we have very clear and radical ideas on what should be done. And we've been consistent in pursuing those ideas. And at some point, we'll be proven either right or wrong. But at the very least, we've been strategically consistent uh, on the vision. And, but we won't know before maybe five or 10 years what it takes to grow a large tech company in Paris. We don't have those yet, so. Yeah. If you want your, to react to that, you're... I was just going to go back to my earlier argument that it all comes down to soft infrastructure mm -hmm. with finding those stories. You know, there's already a, a platform, the events and communities that already exist throughout the ecosystem, there's a platform to tell those stories and, and build them up. Um, and. Um, what's that quote about standing on the shoulders of giants? You know, it's only through the first generation coming through and then people keep learning off them and sharing those ideas. And uh, maybe we can find better ways of building businesses than the traditional models that have fueled Google and Amazon and, and Facebook. And um, you know, I'm really inspired by this community and the conversations that we're having here. And I think these sorts of events and communities will actually allow um, this ecosystem, this Paris ecosystem and Europe ecosystem to build a different type of business. Uh, I don't think that you need to know how to build a Facebook to build brilliant big businesses. I think it would be interesting just to give an example. For example, Porto in Portugal is doing a different thing, which is like we don't have, uh, I think we have one or two unicorn, uh, unicorns at, the, at this time. We have Farfetch, which is a huge company at the moment, and Feedzai, which is growing a lot. But they are doing an interesting thing, which is they don't have these big examples. So they are you know, bringing scale-ups to the center of the city. So they are bringing companies who are there for 10 or 15 years and were actually really cool examples like from you know, the pre-era in Portugal of startups. And they are taking those really interesting uh, companies and putting them into the center of the city to inspire other, uh, other new entrepreneurs. So they are not super giants. But actually, their you know their motivation or the, the the inspiration for them was was basically that you know to bring really interesting examples for them to, to other people to feel inspired by. Thanks a lot. That's very interesting. To, this focus that can be on scale ups instead of, uh, of startups. I see a parallel with what the Israeli government did back in the 90s, uh, because they didn't have uh, the first generation of large uh, Israeli tech companies. They invited um, uh, U.S.-based investors to open local office in Tel Aviv and to invest um, American money in Israeli startups. But with the, those uh, teams from abroad came money, obviously, but also education, good practices, knowledge, talent. And so those investors contributed to educating the local ecosystem based on the example of large companies in the U.S. And so that's a similar approach. You, you can attract large successful companies and, in a city and enroll them to help educate the local ecosystem. They also had like a large defense industry that like in the U.S. also invested a lot in the ecosystem, I guess, in the beginning. At the very beginning. And it, yeah. It's all disappeared in, these, in the 70s. So that's another problem. We look at Silicon Valley and we say, oh, at the origin, the state play a, played a big role and the defense industry was all that mattered. And so we'll do the same here, we, except we're at a very different point in the cycle of uh, current technology. We're not uh, uh, 
at the time when the transistor was invented, we're at the time when the transistors has turned into smartphones and uh, very extremely powerful computers. And so uh, contemporary companies should use that technology and not try to uh, yeah. uh, do what the Silicon Valley did in the 1950s. Which but is if you look bizarre. at like technologies like computer vision, for instance, for autonomous driving, it comes like really from the like companies like Mobileye, for instance, that's been acquired by Intel, really comes from the tech that was developed by the, um, the defense industry in, uh, in Israel. So maybe for early deep tech that can then uh, generate new trends of innovation and growth that can also be something interesting. Yeah. Another tool that um, many countries are using, I mean, I'm seeing it happen here as well, are, are visas um, and programs to attract entrepreneurs into a country. Um, I know that there's, well, I, I was at the New Zealand company at an event a couple of weeks ago that's very excited that he can get 35,000 euros and a visa to come and, and start up his business in Paris. Um, we're doing something kind of different in New Zealand. We've created a global impact visa for people who are doing work that's going to have a positive impact on the planet. Um, and uh, the Edmund Hillary Fellowship is, is how you apply for that. But we've been quite specific in, in the types of people that we're looking for. Um, but people who really want to work with New Zealand, and we see that as an opportunity to um, lift up our ecosystem as well as um, supporting people who are doing good work in the world and realizing the potential of their visions as well. Thanks a lot. Um, we have um, a bit less than 10 minutes maybe to take questions from the audience. So there should be a mic circulating, otherwise we can maybe lend one of ours. Do we have someone who can help to pass the mic, maybe? Yeah. I'll ask a quick question. So it's really nice what you've done with the directory of people in Lisbon. Is it open source, or can other cities like we use that? Uh, is it, it's open source to the city of Lisbon and to the ones who want to participate in, you know, augmenting this project for the city of Lisbon. We now we have the process online, so we are trying. We reevaluate what we did really well and what we did wrong, uh, and now we are structuring the process to to be able to reproduce it. Uh, if you go to witcities.com, you have the process translated in a real clear way. But I cannot say like it's Commons or it's uh, you know. Super I was talking more about the, the the actual website, like the. No, software. the actual website. Uh, it's open for developers, and if they want to participate and to create new stuff. For the city of Lisbon, it's not the purpose to be open to any city okay. or to other cities in the, in the world. If you make it open source, we'd love to use it for Brussels. Thank you. Okay, cool. That's good. Cool. I'll talk to you in the end. Um, hello. I grew up in Silicon Valley. I grew up with Silicon Valley, started a couple companies, or started a company and worked with startups. I was in an incubator. so. I really appreciate this conversation. I would love to have a conversation with all of you. Um, I've agreed with most of what you've been saying, and um, I just wanted to throw something out there, which is most of this conversation has been very focused around tech, and I think some of the conversation so far has really been about perpetuating some of the, I mean, really in an effort to, to maybe say, we don't want to replicate Silicon Valley. I think a lot of this conversation has been about replicating Silicon Valley. So what I want to throw out there is that we live in a different time in history, and what's, what's required is a different kind of entrepreneurial culture, in my opinion, um, in the context of climate change and the destruction of the biosphere, destruction of democracy, the power of corporations. So I appreciate what you were saying about that, Jennifer. What I'd like to ask you, though, is is um, to maybe to say a few words about a new kind of entrepreneurial culture and the role of uh, regular people in playing the different kinds of roles in an ecosystem that can make a new kind of entrepreneurial culture possible, such as uh, investing and supporting entrepreneurs in different ways. I love that you bring up a new type of entrepreneurial culture um, where there's a lot of talk happening and I'm going to focus on, on that and if I don't answer your question enough then please jump back in. Um, 
We, there's been a lot of talk happening in New Zealand that it's not okay to tell entrepreneurs that the only way for them to be successful is to work 20 hours a day, seven days a week, until they're absolutely exhausted. Uh, I've seen that. I've seen, um, I met this young guy who was with one of our incubator managers, and he introduced this guy, Louis, and said, this is Louis. He works seven days a week, 18 hours a day. And I just thought, you poor bastard. Like, this is not sustainable, and it's not cool that he's actually encouraging that. Um, and that conversation is actually evolving into some action as well. I've seen a really neat company that's actually come out of the States called Good Startups, which is supporting founders and having a, a more balanced, um, balanced way of, of starting a business, of taking care of themselves, of actually teaching them um, to uh, lead in a way that nourishes them as well as, as builds a business. And I do feel that there is a transformation happening there within the ecosystem. I mean, you can't help it when people are entrepreneurial, they want to solve problems, and they're looking at the current model of doing entrepreneurship and going, this isn't right. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't benefit people. And I think, again, the really exciting thing about being here, um, having this conversation at uh, WeShareFest, is that we're talking about totally different models of doing business where it's not about necessarily making the person at the top rich. Um, it's not about conforming to a certain job role within an organization, um, but actually a, a way of building businesses that shares and recognizes um, individuals' contribution. And I think the nature of entrepreneurial ecosystems, um, the nature of entrepreneurs, means that that change is going to happen because entrepreneurs aren't going to keep doing the same thing um, and getting the results that they can see aren't benefiting those around them. It's not working. Okay. Um, so I have to say this because I'm a proud owner of a fish shop. It's not a restaurant called Fish Shop. It's, it's a fish shop that sells fish. So despite all of this tech thing, you know, I sell fish, which is, it comes from a family business from more than 100 years. And we really care about, you know, having an open door and talking to people. And I'm just going to say that, you know, relating to the Lisbon project, if you look at Made of Lisboa and if you add a prefix uh, to the beginning, like you will have social innovation Made of Lisboa or you have crowdfunding Made of Lisboa. So it would be also open in terms of brand architecture to fit all of these movements and all, of, you know, because... Lisbon is talking about technology and tech and tech and tech and, we, uh, and entrepreneurship. And we said it's, in a, it's about innovators, it's not about entrepreneurs. So innovator, it's, an op it's a, a broader word, in, in, at least from our perspective. And from the way we built the brand, it was also you know, an open brand in that sense that would take these new... Uh, it's, it's not new, actually, it's taking the old, and it, the old inspiration and the good inspiration uh, to what we're doing at the moment. Actually, I, I would advise you to read you know, a few books from John Takara or John Takara that actually approaches this from a, a really interesting angle. Yes, I, I'd like to use a, a historical argument. The, the technology we're talking about today, so I, information and communication technology or personal computing and networks, is to ec the economy today what mass production and assembly lines were to the economy of the 1920 and 1930s. And the parallel is, inter is, is interesting. It doesn't mean that every single business has to become a mass-producing uh, corporation organized around assembly lines. It really meant that the entire economy would be restructured around those large Fordist companies, which were a new breed of companies. And the par parallel is also, is also interesting because people were suffering when you consider the 40s economy of the 1920s and 1930s, you could say we should invent a different entrepreneurial culture. But that didn't come from the entrepreneurs themselves. That came from the government, who, which imposed collective bargaining, the welfare state, uh, industry, industry regulations, and so on and so forth. And so that's really what we're looking for at the moment. Everybody is pointing Google and Facebook and Amazon and saying, you're, you're evil, you don't pay taxes, you make people suffer, uh, you, uh, Uber uh, reduces uh, its drivers into poverty and so on. 
we're all waiting for the government to step up and invent a, a new collective bargaining for today's economy and a new welfare state for today's economy. It's all, it all doesn't depend on the entrepreneurs. The, ecos the entrepreneurial ecosystem depends on the entrepreneurs, but the rest of the institutions that we need as part of our social contract depends on the government, on society as a whole, and so we all have hard work to do, not only the startup founders. That's what I think. Thanks a lot to you all. I think we are, yeah, I think we are, we are, we are finished now. We have uh, over time. So thanks a lot for this great discussion. I invite, because I see a lot of, of, a lot of hands that were raised, so I invite you to join our speakers after this session to uh, continue the conversation. Thanks you all for your attention. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.